Yes, hello, that's right. It's Joe here live for Joyrider TV. And um, it's nice to have so many of you tuned in already. Um, apologies for the change in kickoff time, but um, I've got a, um, had a scheduling conflict there. But I dare say, for those of you, especially in the US, the slightly later um, starting time is probably beneficial to you. So hello and hello. And um, we're looking at putting on a new speed event in the Bay of Biscay at the moment. It looks like it is blowing dogs off chains over there. So some big speeds could be recorded. I'm just going to go straight in with something that I thought I would do. Just received in the post today. Mystery box. Oh, yeah. Um, I didn't think I was going to do an unboxing video, but I thought I would treat you to a little unboxing. I haven't even looked at this yet myself. So, oh, yes, it is. This is the brand new, I can't remember what the model's called, but this is the brand new Instamic from Instamic. So I would say that, over the years of making the videos on Joyrider TV, the biggest improvement over the years has been the audio quality. Um, if you watch any of the videos, the onboard stuff from, um, I don't know, pre, like pre-COVID, um, the audio quality, especially on the upwind legs, was really, really bad. Like if you were to watch the video from the Tornado Europeans, uh, where we go under the guy who's capsizing at the mark, you know the one. Um, the upwind audio quality is really poor. But on the downwind, because we're going in the same direction as the wind, uh, the audio, audio quality is better. But since then, I've been using the Instamic. I've actually got my old trusty Instamic here. And um, I think you'll agree the quality of the audio has been nothing short of exceptional. So what you get in the box, you get another box. Oh, yes. It's all about presentation round here. How does this come out? Is it a flapper? It's a flapper. We go inside the flap and uh, there's a little message. Then let's peel that message away. Oh, look, and there it is. Oh, he's fallen on the floor. Fortunately, oh, no, not on the floor. Um, these bad boys are extremely durable, totally waterproof. And um, there it is. And I think if we peel back a few more layers, then we get a world of mounting possibilities. There we go. That's what's arrived for me in the post today. There has been something else arrived in the post today for me. But I think before I um, even something even more exciting, what could be more exciting than a microphone? I don't know. But um, well, I do know. And I'm going to let you know. But uh, let's just check in with everybody who's checking in. So hello to Texas. Everybody in Texas, especially Toot. Always great to have you on board, Toot. Hope it's all going well. Hello to Declan in Sweden, where it is snowing. Oh, yes. We've got Ra uh, Ryan. Um, it's Ryan's birthday today, I believe. So happy birthday to Ryan. And um, I'm sure you are in for an absolute rip snorter of a birthday today. So, um, so well done for making it around the sun for another year. Great job there. Um, good to have you with us. Um, who else is on board? We've got Thorn G um, in Germany. Great to have you with us, Thorn G. Um, just skimming through a lot of weather reports on at the moment. Um, we've got Leland Lee um, tuning in from Clearwater, Florida. As always, I think Leland Lee has to win the prize for the um, best rate of attendance 
for these Q and A's, I believe, probably since we've started. So uh, nice for you to be so consistent there, Lee. Um, who else we got? We've got Paul on board. Paul from Wales with the old 16. OK, this was, I believe, the 16 that we were talking about last week with the alarming amount of flex or slightly alarming amount of flex between the hulls. And we were discussing ways to reduce the amount of independent hull movement on Paul's 16. Uh, he says, it seems the gudgeon bolts all have stripped the thread and come loose. I presume they thread into an aluminium captive plate on the inside of the hull. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And um, yes, yeah, so if with um, these uh, more modern style of 16 hull, where if this is the back of the hull, if you've got the gudgeons that are like plates on the back, then you'll have, I think this is the bolt layout here that you have. And all of those bolts um, thread into a plate, which is glassed into a massive block on the inside of the hull. So if um, you've stripped the thread of that aluminium plate on the inside, then there is hope because you could um, you could re-tap the um, plate on the inside, maybe drill it, tap it to a size up and then put in a bigger bolt. Um, and that is reasonably likely to succeed in sorting out that situation. But um, I had all sorts of problems with one of the boats that we had on um, in the Wild Wind fleet. And if we just make this 3D, look at that, 3D. Um, yeah, so what we ended up having to do is I took the boat to a boat builder because I wasn't going to take this on myself. And he actually cut on the inside of the hull a hole big enough to get his hand in and to work on the boat from the inside. Um, then replaced all of the bolts, got them all nice. The, pr the problem was that we had with, um, with this one is a lot of the bolts had snapped inside the um the hull in the plate and in attempting to drill them out the drill had slipped to the side which had made a right mess of everything and did manage to get new bolts in but then they snapped as well so there was something bad going on so um professional boat rebuilder jason who's just in the next town on the island he's very good um he went in from the inside and put some proper high quality nuts and bolts with big fat washers on the inside. Um, so the washers were up against the big plate and that is now absolutely sturdy. And then fit this hole afterwards. So um, there we are. Um, the better reason for going in through the inside rather than the outside is because the outside of the boat takes even though it's flat so you'd think that's an easier repair um the outside of the hull takes i don't know how many times more at least five times maybe ten times more pressure than the inside of the hull so it is definitely a better scheme to do your work on the outside of the hull where it is possible so there we go you weren't even asking a question there, Paul. You were just stating that you've got trouble, but I was just, um, I'm there with you, man. All right. So who else is on board? All right. We've got Montana Help on board, who has a Hobie Rudder question. Well, I believe you've come to the right place, unless you're going to talk about uh, a Hobie Wave from about 97. All right. Yeah, he's got a Hobie Wave from 97. What is required? Oh, dear to use the Hobie Easy Lock rudder system on it? Do I need to change the mounting brackets 
on the hull. Yeah, I, I'm afraid that I'm not so familiar with the easy lock rudder system um, on the Hobies. This is a system that's been used for more of the, I'd say, the more recreational Hobies, which is a, it's a system with um, fewer moving parts. So there's less things that could go wrong. But I think from Hobie's uh, point of view, it's a system that doesn't cost as much to produce. So on the boats where the rudder systems aren't under quite as much load, then um, they uh, don't need to um, supply quite as many parts. If everybody can bear with me for a second, I can actually just bring up a parts manual on um, computer number two, uh, computer number two, because I'm running a the new computer that was um, imported by Office Hands Dave, but unfortunately I still haven't sorted out a, um, a webcam for that computer. Shame on me. All right, so I'm actually going to look at the Hobie 15 parts di diagram which if I had the technology, I could actually show you the parts diagram, but it's not particularly exciting unless you're looking at, all right, sorry about this. Um, just looking for the page, which talks about rudders. Yeah, we've got the old school rudder system on there and then the easy lock rudder system, which, yeah, it does appear that the easy lock rudder system um, does fit on uh, this style of rudder gudgeon where you've got, what would you have? You'd have a hole there, then, um, oh, it's a 15, so how would that be? And then one at the bottom, I think, um, where the pin goes through. So, yes, the e there we go question answered you don't need to replace the gudgeon on the hulls to fit the easy lock rudder system there we go we're coming out with some answers today um absolutely chuffed to bits with the new microphone um i haven't even switched it on yet or charged it but uh very exciting yeah the insta mic you can it's a double-edged sword um because there's two ways you can use it one is how I use it, where I record the audio actually onto the microphone, like there's a some sort of little storage device within, like a hard little tiny little hard drive inside, and then I sync the audio with the video afterwards. Um, but the other way you can do it is actually with Bluetooth. You can Bluetooth it to your telephone, to your camera, to anything you like. I could probably Bluetooth it to my computer and walk somewhere else and the audio would stay consistent but not today all right so lee says as always in florida tomorrow is the last race for me of the season then it's on to boat projects to prepare for next year's winnings great stuff yeah keep us posted um i don't know if we've seen this is big news i think we'll all agree show us your cat the return of um and what an episode to kick off with. Um, now, you may be thinking, all right, show us your cat season is back on. I'm telling you, the only, re the only way that show us your cat season is going to continue to be on is if more people show me their cats. I think since last week, I've only had one or two um, people email me with some pictures. So, Unless there's at least three, I'm not going to uh, put the next episode out of Show Us Your Cat. So if you want more Show Us Your Cat, then you're going to have to Show Us Your Cat. There we go. Um, and anything at all is invited, as you will have seen in last week's episode. All right. So hold on. I'm um, just... All right, so uh, don't know where we are. Oh, Benny's on board. Benny in Sweden. Nice to have you with us, Benny. Uh, great to have you on board. 
Uh, channel member Aaron is on board in New Zealand. Good morning. Uh, great to have you with us. As always, Johannes is with us from Berlin, Germany. Uh, wonderful to finally be able to join live. Uh, thank you so much for this awesome channel. Thank you very much for being one of the people who makes this channel actually happen by watching the videos. Um, if it wasn't for people watching the videos, I'd probably stop making the videos, to be honest, because um, they do require some sort of effort. And um, if no one was watching, that effort would be for nothing. All right, we've got Jens on board in Germany also. Nice to have you with us, Jens. Mazel. Mizel, sorry, um, in Brazil. All right, nice to have you with us. Um, we really are stretching out to um, many of the parts of the world today. We've now got Brazil, America, um, New Zealand, Sweden, um, probably a bit more America. Oh, I see we've got Maui on board. Very nice. Um, everybody is tuning in. Uh, let us know. Let us know where you're tuning in from if you're going to ask a question, because it's nice to know. All right. So. Leland Lee says, I thought it was going to be a brand new boat in the box. Well, seeing as you've mentioned it. Yeah, I had another delivery today. And um, yes, it was a boat. All right. More to come on that in the coming days, I'm sure. Uh, very exciting delivery of a boat. Um, so, yeah, so what this delivery of the boat means is that I am going to actually be making some on the water videos throughout the uh, winter months here in Greece, um, hopefully from some different venues as well. So I'm going to be exploring the um, other parts of the island and perhaps even further afield. So watch this space. Declan says, does that new Instamic float? Uh, no, I haven't tried actually, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't float. So I use a similar level of security with the microphone that I use with the GoPro. Um, <coughs> the Instamic I generally have around my neck. Um, I actually use an old, um, not even old, a Lycra headband where I've kind of modified it so I can actually put the microphone inside the headband that goes round the neck, then um, Lycra top over the top of that. And that is the security that I'm using to look after that bad boy there. Without the Lycra, I think we'd still be getting some wind noise because there's no actual, uh, what you call it, a dead cat um, <laughs> attached to the microphone as standard. But with the two layers of Lycra, lovely. All right, we've got Mr. Spicy Fist One on board. I was thinking that was going to be a 360 camera. All right, on the subject, have you tried many? And what do you recommend? I'm leaning towards the GoPro Max, but the Insta360 X2 and One R look very good indeed. Yeah, I think those Insta cameras do look very nice indeed. It I think two things that differentiate the two. The one that I use is the GoPro Max. And in, in fact, with the GoPro Max, I've um, been a member of what did they call it? GoPro Plus, where you pay it's about 50 euros a year to be a member. They give you storage for your videos. You get accessories for a discounted rate. But also you can change your cameras for new ones. Uh, they say no questions asked and it was apparently free, but I think they've changed their scheme. So it's now 95 euros to change your camera for a new one. And the GoPro Max and the GoPro Hero 8 um, that I've been using a lot, I think they're probably going to give up next year. So I've actually sent those back off to GoPro to be replaced for brand new ones for just 95 bucks, which I think for the for the Max especially is pretty decent where you get a brand new camera back in return. 
Mm. I think that's that's a good thing. I've been very happy with the performance of the GoPro Max. Um, the uh, the benefit of the GoPro Max over the Insta, I would say, is the form of it, where um, the Max is very much square. I haven't got it here because I've sent it away. Hmm. Um, but it's a square, probably um, about as tall as your phone is wide, maybe slightly less um, tall than that, but a proper square. Whereas the Insta is longer and thinner, which means if you did have it mounted to your helmet, you're more likely to whack it on something. And it does look a little bit less um, satisfactory when mounted on um, a, a boat. It just sticks out a little bit more for me. Um, the one benefit that I've seen of the uh, Insta camera is actually in the software, the editing software where you choose... Um, if you didn't know, by the way, these 360 cameras basically film everything. So you don't need to worry about where they're pointing uh, when you mount it. It will just film a whole, literally everything. It's got two lenses. And um, then afterwards, you can decide on what you want to look at. Nice. Um, with the Insta in the software, you can get it to track things. Um, so if you're sat on the boat, if you're sailing the boat and you just want the footage to be of you, you just say, I want it to track me for the whole thing. And then that's it. Job done. Whereas with the GoPro, the Max, you have to do what's called key frame, key frames where um, you have to move the video along, say, yes, I want to still be looking at that or I want to look over there now. And then move the video along. And there we are. Move the video along. I want to look at that. So it's a more time consuming process with the GoPro Max. If you want to track something, you have to do it yourself. Mm. Nice. Yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I... I use a Max and I'm very happy with its performance. You can also use it as a regular camera. And for me, um, which one is this? This is actually a five, um, but the five is the same to look at as as um, up to the eight. For, so on my eight, it doesn't have a forward facing screen, so I can't see what I'm doing. So I actually use the Max for all of the filming that I do on land because when it's looking at me, I can actually see, make sure that I'm in the right spot, uh, like standing in the right place. There we go. All right, we've got Mike on board. Um, oh no, Mike's got COVID, uh, so was able to join. All right, well, I'm glad that there's some positive um, that has come out of that. Um, I found my COVID experience was um, all about setting up the bedroom as a um, as a cinema. Yeah, that's what I did back then. All right, we've got John on board in Texas. Congrats on that new mic. Agree, your video's really improved with it. Yeah, I thought so too. And probably the other thing that made the big difference to the videos as far as I was concerned was um, the GoPro um, Max, which was actually a gift that was given to me by Trey, um, who was actually, Trey was actually, I think, one of the pioneering people from the USA who journeyed across the Atlantic to come out um, on holiday to Greece um, because he'd seen the uh, the champagne sailing on Joyrider TV. So there we go. Thanks again to that, Trey, if you're watching or if you're watching later. All right. So Paul, uh, his 16 is the two part gudgeon. Yeah. So the slightly older 16s and a lot of the old older Hobies have two stainless plates like this 
um, and something similar there. Yeah, so I would, yeah, I wouldn't be so confident to know what's going on inside your hull with those um, style of gudgeons on there, just because I've not actually experienced what it looks like on the inside of a hull with those gudgeons. So sorry, I can't help you any further on that one with those. All right, we've got Chuck on board. Um, been watching your videos for years. Nice. Older guy returning to the water. Lovely. Very nice. Loved sailing as a young adult. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Glad that you're getting back into it there, Chuck. And um, yeah, we're always here if there's anything you need to know, of course. All right. Cux Oli is on board, I believe, in Germany. Great to have you with us. Thanks for tuning in. OK, Declan's done some research. Yes, they fit on the pin tools. All right. Montana help. Thanks. for that. Yeah. OK. Um, sorry, quite a lot in the live chat. So I'm having to do a bit of um, artistic skimming. That's what we're calling it. All right. Alan is on board. Alan from Australia. Great stuff. Are you looking forward to going to Mauritius? Well, as far as I knew, I wasn't going to Mauritius anytime soon. So if um, if somebody is um, is hooked me up with a trip to Mauritius, thank you very much. Um, I went to Mauritius just before COVID started. So what year would that have been? 2020, was it? Um, because I was lucky to get back before all the restrictions went in. And it really is. It's, you know, what we have here in Vasiliki Bay is champagne sailing no doubt about it some of the best if you like if you like strong wind flat water um just for half a day every day not all you know sometimes if you've got it all day every day it's a bit much you know who who can last for five days of doing that whereas having it so it's windy just in the afternoons it's very sociable here um because, because also when you get up in the morning, you don't want to be, if you're like me, a bit of a wind addict. And if you know it's windy, you then, unless you're actually rigging the boat or you're doing something that is going to get you out onto the water, you're feeling a bit edgy. Um, if you're somewhere where it's windy all day, every day, how do you shake off that edgy feeling if you're not on the water? You're just sort of like, yeah, OK. All right. Yeah, that's nice. Um, OK, cup, down the cup of coffee and we're off. Um, yeah. So that's what's it is champagne here in Vasiliki, uh, Lefkus, Greece, whereas Mauritius, rather than it being champagne, I would say it is paradise sailing. It's not as strong. Um, you don't get um, quite as high quality flat water and strong winds with as much area they do have flat water and strong winds inside um they've got a lagoon and then you go out through a reef and then you get this rolling swell with really consistent wind probably average when i was there was about 15 16 knots but with big swell which really does um uh raise the eyebrow makes it very exciting sailing um but it's absolute paradise the water is like bath water. The colour of it looks like even looking through your own eyes, it looks like um, it's already been photoshopped. Um, and um, there's so many places to sail to. And the food, I know the food hasn't got anything to do with the sailing, but the food is absolutely mega. All right. So Ryan says... How do we know what time the Q&A will start ahead of time? Do you post that anywhere? No. Um, yeah. Again, apologies for the rather wayward starting times. But I believe what you should see is if you go. I've generally got the Q&A set up, ready to go uh, by about what would it be by about six hours before. So um, I suppose. 
what I need to start doing is setting it up the day before. So if you are in um, in the USA and it's first thing in the morning for you, then you'd know the day before what time it's going to be. Um, but generally, if, if you want to find out what time it's going to be, if I've set it up, like today I set it up um, at about, I don't know, about one o'clock, um, seven o'clock here now in the evening. Um, so, yeah, six hours before, um, what is to go um, to the Joyrider TV page on YouTube where it says all the videos there, click on live and it will say um, what live videos are coming up and when they're going to be. So that is how to find out. Uh, yeah, apologies again for that. But good to have you with us. You seem to have made it. All right. Toot says... Buchanan Sailing, Buchanan Sailing Club have two Hobie 16s for loner boats for traveling sailors. This is very good to know. So that's Buchanan Sailing Club in Texas. So if you're heading to Texas, check out Buchanan Sailing Club. Get in touch, give them a call and see um, if you can borrow one of their loner boats. All right. We've got Mark and Janet on board from Ohio. Completely winterized. Yeah, it's, um, it's that time of year, isn't it? All right, we've got Philip on board, who I believe is in Ireland. Uh, just got back from the beach with my Hobie 18. Nice. Hope you had a good sail. Got Jason on board. Hi there. Question regarding how you measure wind speed, etc. displayed on the screen. Oh, yes, I saw your comment in... um in the video in question, this, yeah, it wasn't wind speed that was being displayed. Although I um, I know where you're coming from. It would look very much like wind speed, but this was one of the older videos. Um, I think it was the video about going out um, on the Hobie 16 solo without the jib. And we had the, the gauge, the telemetry, on there with the speedo around the outside and on the inside it had a kind of compass kind of vibe like this with an arrow and that arrow was shifting round quite a lot which would lead you to believe that that is the direction of the wind somehow We've got some sort of technology on board the boat, which tells us to the camera, to the GPS, which way the wind's coming from. But no, sorry, it was just um, because the GoPro telemetry, which you can't even use anymore um, from their app. Um, this was actually the compass bearing of the direction in which the camera was pointing. So the camera pointing that way would say, which way would that be? That would be pretty much south from where I'm sitting. But the reason it was swinging around a lot is because I had the camera on my head. So that was happening. So there we go. So unfortunately, no, I didn't have anything that fancy going on. Um, but what I could tell you is because of the failings of the GoPro app telemetry and that you couldn't put it in knots, you couldn't do anything with it and then you couldn't use it at all. I started using, uh, tele uh, what's it called? Um, telemetry overlay, which is actually the name of the website. And it was, I had to actually put my hand in my pocket and pay for the telemetry. Um, but straight away when I paid for it, soon as I'd paid the money, downloaded the, the app, it works so well. And the telemetry that you see is only a fraction of what you can do with it. But I just have to try to restrain myself and not go absolutely crazy, putting all sorts of stuff all over the screen, because that might start looking a little bit messy, I believe. Um, but yes, um, telemetry, uh, telemetry overlay. Very good. 
and any GoPro since the GoPro 5, anything newer than a 5, has an inbuilt GPS so you can extract the GPS data. As long as it's switched on, you might need to pop into settings to have a look uh, to get your GoPro information. Uh, one thing I've learned is to get accurate um, GPS data from your camera, don't use the one button record feature where it goes from being off to recording. You want to switch it on first. Don't know if it's got a battery in it. No. So you switch it on using the button on the side, then give it a minute, like you would with a GPS watch. Give it a minute to find the satellites. And then after a minute, it won't tell you that it's found them, but about a minute is what seems to work. Then start recording. And then that means you'll have good GPS data right from the start. There we look. <clears throat> okay. And uh, Jason is um, coming in from Brazil. Great to have you with us in Brazil. Um, very nice. All right. So Mike says, how far down is the Solo C2 on your list of videos to make? How far down the list? Yeah. Um, it's a little way down there. I I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a little way down there. But um, can I pull that up quickly? Yeah, this would be quite interesting, actually, which of what I've got on the videos to make list. All right. So. Number one on the video to make list is how slowly can you go? This is on the afloat list. So, yeah, somebody asked. They said not everybody wants to go as fast as possible. In fact, some people find it rather frightening. And I thought, fair enough. So I thought what I would do, which I clearly haven't done, is to go out when it's windy and see how slowly you can go on each point of sail. So the trick, the challenge here would be on the downwind points of sail where you can't really slow down very much. Um, then there was one start practice. Next was downwind angles. Um, so what is the faster angles to sail downwind? I wasn't quite sure how to put this one together, so I didn't um, put it together just yet. Um, then I had one that I called Duke's Stunt, which was basically a quite a dangerous stunt where you suspend two people in the air by having two boats um, side by side, um, stunt performer who needs to be quite light clips on to both a trapeze from both boats. This sounds quite dangerous. I've seen it done on, um, oh, what's his name? The Hobie 14 world champion um, from Australia. I can't remember his name. Sorry, can't remember your name off the top of my head. Um, very good videos, though. Um, Totally Immersed TV. That's the name of the channel. Um, and the boats sail apart. So, of course, the trapeze artist goes up in the air. Yeah, haven't quite done that. After that is C2 Solo. So there we go. It's not so far down the list. And then um, at the bottom, not so much on the afloat list because the season's finished, is downwind sailing, apparent wind angles and BMG. So a lot of downwind stuff. And then, yeah, loads on the on land list. But I won't go through that just now. There we go. All right. So um, just scrolling down. Uh, we've got Mr. Tony KP in Denmark. Um, all right. But he's not in Denmark. He's actually from Fort Worth, Texas. Nice. Um, but heading home to Denmark. I hope you had a good time in Texas. All right, we've got fat pictures with a PH. Moin. Um, I've learned that is the local variation on how you say um, Guten Tag, I believe, in the north of Germany, like from Hamburg and upwards. Phenomenal job. Thank you very much. Absolutely mega. Glad you think so. All right, we've got Max in Rosenheim, Germany. 
We've got all of Germany on board and Max is going sailing, wanted to go sailing with Jan today, but it was raining cats and dogs. Yeah, I think the European weather has been pretty funky um, of late with all sorts of stuff um, all over the chip shop. All right. So uh, Declan says the compass heading is the calculated heading rather than the direction where the camera is pointing. Oh, interesting. Um, as in the direction of travel. Well, that's pretty clever. Yeah, I, I can't even think how it would calculate that. And uh, don't try to explain, please, because um, it will fry my brain at this moment in time. Oh, that's very interesting. So the movement of the head wasn't actually moving the gauge, which is probably why the gauge wasn't moving quite so much. All right, we got Craig on board in New Zealand. Um, in All right, question. In your service, the rudders video, you drill out the casting with a 12 mil bit. Oh, dear. I did a test and there's a lot of play in a 12 mil hole with the bushings. Is that normal? No, there shouldn't be. When? No. Maybe it is. There is a slight discrepancy in the size of the bushings because um, we're getting our bushings from France where. Correct me if I'm wrong. I probably am. Um, but I think in France, they're in. Is it Imperial in France? First one to answer wins um, the kudos of knowing. Um, yeah, I think it's Imperial in France. So the drill bit that I use for drilling out the rudder castings might be different. Metric in France. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, so couldn't answer that with any amount of confidence, I'm afraid, Craig. Um, but no, it's not normal. When I drill them out, the bush goes in snug. And after a while, once wear and tear is set in, um, then there's sometimes a bit of play, which is why I would then use some electrical tape to fatten the bush up. All right. All right. So Jason says, unfortunately, here in Brazil, it's hard to get Hobie Cat. We'll have to import one. Any suggestions where I can buy one? Um, I would if you're looking to buy a boat, uh, a Hobie 16, it does seem that a very good uh, place to ask these sort of questions, as well as Joyrider TV, of course, is on one of the Facebook groups, um, which are very um they are very popular with people, especially those who are buying or selling gear. So I would join. Is it called Hobie Cat Sailors on Facebook? Um, put a, a request on there. Does anybody know of anyone in Brazil selling a Hobie 16 or a, any sort of Hobie? And then um, take it from there. You'll get so many suggestions from that. that uh, that's going to help. All right. Uh, top tip here from Toot. He says, hit the like button. Yeah, if you could hit the like button, that would be very handy because that would mean that more people um, will um, get this video put in front of them later on. So thanks for that. All right. We've got Marcus on board um, from the tornado class. He says, do you have your media trophy Yes, I do. Um, yeah, Marcus is one of the main players in the Tornado class. And he uh, both created and presented me with this fine award for services to, um, I can't remember how it was worded, but this was the media trophy for doing a great job in covering the events. So thanks again, Marcus. Yes, it's it's got the best place in my uh, Joyrider TV studio here in Greece. Um, and I love it very much. Thank you. Um, question for Marcus, in fact, is 
when would be approximately when would you expect the events for 2024 in the tornado class to be announced? I think that's a good question. If everyone wants to know that. Let's see if we can get some American tornadoes to come across the Atlantic or American tornado sailors to get in touch with the class association um, and maybe see if somebody has got a boat that they would charter for an event. How about that? I think that's a good idea. All right. So um, fat pictures, my question to you. Uh, my Hobie 14, after one hour in the water with two people on board, five to 10 litres of water inside one hull, making it impossible to turn back upright after capsizing even during windy conditions. Uh, could not lift the heavier side until now. Could not find the leak in the hull any idea of where to look okay this is um a question that does come up a lot in fact i think i'm going to make a new video once the dust settles on um leaky boat so I haven't drawn one of these yet today. So, um, so the first places to look would be, sorry about the reflection there, by the way, we could probably get rid of that. Um, the first places to look would be anywhere where the hull has got a fitting or a joint. So the, most likely place a boat will leak, uh, a boat that has a bung will be around the bung fitting and the bung housing. So this, because that sits under the water all the time. Um, and it might be the actual fitting itself. Um, and it's quite easy to unscrew the bung housing, take it out, clean off the old sealant, put new sealant on, put the bung housing back on. Then we need to make sure that the actual bung itself, the drain plug, the stopfen, um, has, um, is not very worn. If uh, the bung itself is looking like the thread is um, not in perfect condition anymore, they're very inexpensive. So it's worth replacing them and make sure the bungs have got seals. Next place would be the gudgeons on the back of the boat. Um, be again, because these sit, at least half of them, especially on a 14, sit in the water a lot of the time. So that would be the most, the next most likely place that water could be getting in. Next place, and this is significant. This could be actually what, um, all right. Cheers, Declan. I'll see you soon with some more. And thanks for all of the advice. Um, and uh, have a great weekend. Next place, and this is significant where your boat could be leaking, is the joint on the gunnel. So um, you've got the deck of the boat comes down there. The side wall of the boat comes like that. And they join. This is actually... A glue joint up here and um, so that is all the way around the boat where the deck is glued on to the rest of the hull so what I would do if your boat is built it's a little bit tricky to turn it upside down so I would probably put the boat on a trolley then put one end of the boat up in the air um, and then just have a good look all the way along. Along there, around the back, on the inside as well, all the way to the bow. And you're just looking for any cracking under there. 
And that is a very likely place where your boat would be leaking. If you have got uh, cracking there, then that is going to be um, quite likely. The last place where your boat might be leaking. And if, you've, if you're capsized and the hole which has been in the water has filled up um, with water, then again, it might be this, this joint here. But it could also be either the pylons here or you do have on not on all boats, but on some you have a breather hole that is actually on the pylon so the air can pass inside to balance the pressure. And that is actually underneath the, the casting. And it might be water's got in through there. So those are the spots where the boats could be leaking. One thing you could do to pressure test your hulls is take a bung, an old one or, or a new one. Depends how flash you're feeling. If this is the bung looking onto it, there's the bit that you hold and twist. Then drill a hole down the middle of the bung like that. And then put... Um, like the inside of a biro into the hole, get a good seal on there. If you if you really want to do a good job, uh, use some sealant, seal it in. And then a biro is quite handy because you can actually put a bike pump or a, yeah, a bike pump onto a biro. It clips on there pretty well. And then pump up your hull, put soap around all the, Fittings like you did, you like you would if you were testing a uh, a tire for a leak, um, and then just look for any bubbles which are appearing. There we go. That's quite an extensive answer. Thanks very much for your question. All right, I would say at this stage, if um, we could hold fire with any more questions in the live chat, um, because we're at fifty minutes, still got some. Um, preloaded questions to look at and my wife is away at the moment and I've got to cook my son's dinner hmm yeah sausages tonight yeah there we are all right let's see where we are so all right just scrolling through now oh, Paul says if you get a tire valve and put a rubber bung in place. You can pressure it. Yeah, same. It's what I same sort of thing. Uh, Mike says, do you think that could come up with um, a list of the top three cats that could be right? So do you think you could come up with a list of the top three cats that could be right solo by somebody 85 kilograms? Yes, I think I could. The Hobie 14 would be one. Um, yeah, they'd have to be like the Hobie 14, um, the Dart 15, nice boat, skeg hulls. Um, and then yeah, other boats of a similar size. It depends on how much wind there is with this capsized writing. How much weight does it take to write the boat? So in zero wind, 85 kilograms should be able to write a Hobie 14 in um, 20 knots of wind, 85 kilograms. You should be able to write a Hobie 16 or a Dart 18 single handed um, because as you get the wind going under the mainsail, um, that helps to blow the boat back upright. So it really does depend on the wind strength. Um, I've, of course, been championing the capsize writing bag a uh, big bag of water you sling over your shoulder to basically uh, add a load of weight and with the bag with about um 30 kilos of water for me i'm a bit over 90 kilos um so about 125 kilograms i can write a hobie 16 in no wind at all which means if there was more wind then I'd be able to write it more easily. There we go. 
Okay. Oh, this is a good question. A uh, good suggestion from Fat Pictures. I think a fog machine uh, used for leaks in car manifolds uh, would be very good. Find the leaks. Yes. All right. So just on to these pre-loaded questions, which I have. Um, just having to turn this back on so that I can see. Um, all right. This is from Lunasis, 1975. Um, I broke my comp tip on my mast and I need to replace the rivets in the bow tang. Any advice on changing rivets? Yeah, my method that if I ever have to drill rivets out, First thing is you might as well invest in a very good drill bit. There's nothing worse than trying to drill rivets out, especially in mast fittings where all of the rivets are made of stainless steel or inox. So they're very, they're tough rivets. Um, I would, um, yeah, get a good drill bit and if this is the rivet, the head of the rivet, there we go. And there's the mast. The technique that I've adopted over the years, rather than the, the most of the rivets used on Hobie Cats are five mil, five millimeters. So you'd think, OK, I'll take a five millimeter drill bit and drill it out with that. Now, what I find happens if you do that is once your drill bit has penetrated um, the top, then quite likely to happen is the whole rivet starts spinning round. So your drill bit isn't actually doing anything. So um, Toot says three sixteenths in the US. Thanks for that. So what I do instead of this is I take a much larger drill bit, like um, a six and a half, maybe even an eight, and just drill down the middle enough until the top of the rivet becomes separated. You'll know when it becomes separated because it will come off. Um, and then stop. This means you're much less likely to damage your mast while you're dri drilling these bad boys out. Um, you don't want to damage your mast. So um, just drill the top off. And then I take a punch and just knock the rest of the rivet through into the mast. Yes, that does mean uh, your mast is going to have an old bit of dead rivet floating around inside. But um, then it means you're less likely to make the hole that the rivet goes into any bigger. And there's much less drilling involved. So that is how I go about drilling out the rivets in masts. So there you go. Hope that helps. Oh, and then the final one, this is good. Um, especially seeing we've got a lot of people in Germany on board today. Um, it's a right of way question. This is from Gregor Schlusner 9024. Um, so I won't read out the question. I'll just, uh, because it's quite confusing how it's worded, but what? So in the English speaking world, this boat, we've got the wind coming over the left side of the boat first. The left side is the port side of the boat. Uh, the right side is the starboard side of the boat. And in the English speaking world, I think it's all of the English speaking world. We describe the tack that the boat is on as being the side of the boat, which the wind is coming over first. So in this situation, the boat is on port tack. If it was the opposite, Like here, 
this boat would be on starboard tack. And here I've actually indicated the starboard tack boat with the color green, which um, it's associated with port associated with the color red. Now, in I don't know which other countries, but in Germany, I'm pretty sure. And in Holland, the um, the tack of the boat is described as being the side of the boat which the sails are over. So um, in uh, I think it's German and in Dutch. Uh, starboard is called steerboard steerboard and port is called backboard which does make a bit more sense because you know where did port come from um yeah so in german or dutch this boat here would be said to be winds coming the sails are hanging over the starboard side of the boat so this would be called steerboard rather than port or rather than the other way around so the the actual definitions are kind of backwards in Germany and Holland. And if anybody tuned in or in the comments section later could say if there's other countries which um, do it this way round, that would be very useful to everybody. So that is where some confusion comes in, especially on the race course, if you've got... Um, well, in theory, I suppose, if you were on steerboard sailing a Dutch boat, you wouldn't actually be shouting at another boat steerboard because you wouldn't have right of way anyway. So the definitions are different, but the right of way rules are still exactly the same. So a boat on um, backboard has right of way over a boat which is on steerboard. There we go. I'm sure you enjoyed that. That's uh, been my favourite question of the day, in fact. Uh, it's a question I've been waiting for since started doing these um, Q&A sessions. So thanks very much, Gregor, for um, giving that one an airing. Okay. Just like to say hello to Stephen, who is uh, in now says the bag is the answer, although balancing it on your shoulder can be a bit tricky. Yeah, for the capsize writing. Agreed. It does take. Don't if you've never tried it before, don't be surprised if the first time that you try it, it slips off your shoulder and you have to reset it's not that easy, but once you've done it once, like a great many things, it does become a lot easier. OK, so there we go. Um, I think that is about the size of it. Thanks to everybody for tuning in live who's been live. Thanks to everybody uh, later on for watching all the way through to the end. Don't forget to hit the like button. Um, subscribe to Joyrider TV if you are into a bit of catamaran sailing. If you want to get hold of your own Insta mic, then just check out the link in the description below. Um, it means if you use that link when you get one, um, the actual price of the microphone will be the same as if you just used a uh, Google search to get there. But I get small commission, which it all helps. Yes. So there we go. See you soon with some more. And adios uh, to Toot and to Craig and everybody else. And um, good luck this weekend. Stay safe out there, especially if you're sailing in the Bay of Biscay. Uh, nice one, Willis. Um, good to have you with us. Good to have you back. Toodaloo. Time to make dinner.